Hello, everyone. Why is there lights back? Um, whiteboard lights. Power. Power. No, I'm backwards. <laughs> that's, that's the best lit. No? I think Wait. it's actually when everyone yeah. puts stage lights on all the face of the person. Should side? we just put on all lights? That's fine. Oh, we're, we're fine. I'm just, I'm just trying to have courtesy for the live students. Yeah. They're going to get these really terrible backlit photos. <laughs> <laughs> it does matter. So if you didn't know, this event is part of the Coital Summer School. And yes, I'm authorized to call it a Coital, aren't I? <laughs> we have Coedl, Coedl, and I say Coital and just live with it. So Coital is the Center of Excellence for Language Dynamics, the ARC Center. And all this week we've been having our summer school and we've had some public talks. Um, Tuesday evening we had Dr. Alfeus Graham Zombule, who maybe is here in audience tonight, I'm not sure. And tonight we have the wonderful Gretchen McCulloch. And we also have some people here who are not summer schoolers. I've seen at least one. You're also very welcome. Um, so Gretchen and I actually know each other from a couple of years back. Don't know how many. Um, however, this is the first time we meet in the so-called flesh world. For those who don't understand what this is about, we, we have known each other on the internet. Um, I do public outreach and she does public outreach at a massive scale uh, on the blog All Things Linguistics and lately also on the podcast Lean Enthusiasm with Lauren Gorn, which I highly recommend you to listen to. Um, there are other music podcasts out there as well. Including <laughs> <Like> yours. <laughs> Including mine. <laughs> um, Gretchen and I share something else as well, which is the spelling of our last name. So uh, if you ever make a name tag for her, make sure to spell it that way. That's all the C's you want, two of them. Three of them, but two of them in a row. Um, I also find myself having some last name issues sometimes. Anyway, um, Gretchen is known as the internet linguist, and for good reason. She's done a lot to defend internet language usage. Um, people clanking down on millennials and how they speak, they've all got it wrong. And next year she's releasing a book called Because, because Internet. I got that right? Sorry. Close to the mic. That's okay. I can also not breathe into it. Um, with Penguin. Um, she's also the linguist resident, resident linguist at Wired. Um, and uh, if you want to know any of these things, uh, I recommend visiting her blog, All Things Linguistic, or GretchenMcCullough.com. She has all the things. Um, um, but among other things, she's written about the uh, one of my personal favorites is the Benedict Cumberbatch, Cumberbatch name generator. Um, if anyone's familiar with it, so there's a familiar pattern where you can sort of make up any kind of words, and people will immediately recognize it as a play on the word Benedict Cumberbatch. For example, bourgeoisie ampersand. <laughs> This, this looks unfamiliar to some people, but trust me, it's really funny. <laughs> um, what am I missing now? Those are... Oh, well, you're going to be talking about emojis now, so I don't need to say too much about it. Um, but emojis <coughs> is one of the bits of internet language that Gretchen has been a very strong defender of. Um, and I think, I think that's it. I'll leave it to you. Welcome, Gretchen. Is my mic on now? Okay. Back row, can you hear me? Uh, lapel mics, great. So thank you very much, Henry, for that introduction. It's really fun to be here in Canberra and in Australia generally, meeting all the linguists that I've known via the internet and via their, their publications for so long. And also, of course, huge thanks to Kotal for having me here. Um, and once I had agreed to do the course about linguistic communication, also invited me to give this talk. Um, so this is kind of the, um, I've been told uh, that this is common where you do the thing in Australia where you, you test the thing for the other market. So like the tap to pay on the credit card system came to Australia like 15 years before it came anywhere else because it was like, here's a place where we can test this. Um, so you can consider this the test version of this talk, uh, which is a talk that I'll probably end up giving a bunch of times when my book comes out, but I haven't given yet. Um, <laughs> So this is the uh, not only the Australia debut uh, for the uh, here's here's what's 
here's what's going on, but also the, the debut of beginning to talk about internet language uh, in the context that I'm going to be, be doing for the book, uh, and with things that I've been thinking about a lot for the past three or four years um, while writing it, but haven't tried on an audience yet. So if you're willing to be guinea pigs along with me, um, we can see how this goes. Uh, so, uh, and to that end, I have very minimalist slides. Um, we need to start uh, by talking about, when I say internet language, when I'm interested in internet language, when I say come with me as we talk about internet language, what exactly do we mean by this? And it would be easy to say, oh, well, these kids these days, on their phones all the time, anything that the kids are doing must perforce the internet language, and anything that their parents are doing or their grandparents are doing is that kind of older generation and doesn't really understand the internet. And so it just becomes another synonym for kids these days. <laughs> we could do this. It's what a lot of people instinctively reach towards. But I think, as linguists, a more interesting way of framing this problem is thinking about the kinds of decisions that we all make when we use language in the context of an internet device. So things that kids these, kids, kids these days have always talked different from their elders. Kids these days have always done something different with language. So just because kids are picking up on some slang doesn't mean that it's particularly internet. What makes it internet -y is that it's created in the context of, here's the decision that I'm trying to make as I'm communicating with someone in this particular context. And in the internet context, one of the big things that distinguishes the kinds of language that we, do, that we make, produce on the internet versus the kind of language that we produce in other contexts is that internet language is often written down and informal at the same time. And this is historically pretty weird. Um, when we talk about different styles of language, it's really easy to make a dichotomy. So on the one hand, you have the formal, the written down, the books, the newspapers, they go through editors, they go through copy editing, they, get, they have a, a prescriptive tradition, they're monologues, no one else is is communicating with you, you know, when I write this book, you can, you can yell at me, but I won't be able to hear you back, which is going to be great, I think. <laughs> um, they're, they're, they're thought, they're composed, they're planned, all of these kinds of things happen, and they're often relatively formal. They have long paragraphs, they have long sentences, they support extended narration, um, and this is what we often think of traditionally when it comes to writing. And now we have the flip side of that. So when we think about speaking, we often think about the informal, the conversational, the back and forth, you know, here's me talking, here's you replying, we have this exchange, it's lively, it's dialogue, it's back and forth, it's not premeditated, you don't get to plan it. It's not rehearsed and footnoted, uh, and in extended sentences you have interruptions and swift repairs uh, when you say something you were intending to be saying. So, Here's this distinction. And yet, along comes the internet. And along comes internet writing. And this is coming back to kind of the chat rooms of the 1990s, um, which maybe I should have put some chat room text up there so you can feel old or young, depending on <laughs> when you were around for chat rooms. <laughs> How many people remember the chat rooms of the 90s? Well, we've got some people, and we've also got some not people. Some people not. <laughs> um, so, Early internet researchers, uh, who are often the kinds of people that spent a lot of time in the chat rooms of the 1990s, because when you're a linguist, it's hard to turn that linguist half of your brain off. Um, and so they're spending time in the chat rooms of the 1990s, and they're seeing something that looks like this interesting mix of the written, because it's writing, of course, but it's not writing in the book and newspaper paragraph format. It's quick, and it's conversational, and it's got this back and forth. And, you know, this is weird. We haven't seen this in writing before. This is exciting. People are doing a different thing. And there were a lot of words batted around 
to try to describe what makes this internet writing particularly special. And you know, how is it just, um, as the linguist John McWhorter put it, texting is like fingered speech. Um, this is really exciting. And so, but I also think this is kind of missing something. Because, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I've been talking for the last 15 minutes. Has anyone noticed this? <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay. Um, and yet, this has not been a conversation. <clears throat> You know, Hedley gave this very nice introduction, and then since then, no one else has talked at all. And yet, I may even have planned some of the words that I said to you tonight. I may be engaging in a, in a monologue. I may be talking in longer sentences than I really would ordinarily. I don't go home and talk to my dog like this. I don't go home and talk to my dog with slides. I don't have a dog. <laughs> I told my students in the Lincoln course I was going to say that line and always get a laugh, and I'm never quite sure why. <laughs> um, so, then we can back up for a second and say, okay, wait, you know, internet language is something weird because it's writing and it's back and forth and it's conversational and it's unplanned and it's spontaneous and look, isn't that exciting? But we can back up for a second and say, wait a second, I shouldn't have been drawing a line here, I should have been drawing a square. And this square has two dimensions, because there's a speech that's a lot like this formal kind of writing that you've also been thinking about. This is a speech that's planned, it's not spontaneous, it's a monologue, and in many cases it can have a very old prescriptive tradition or a very old system of norms. Some of the earliest bits of writing that we have, epic poems like the Epic of Gilgamesh, Beowulf and the Iliad and the Odyssey and these kinds of poems are from a formal spoken tradition. <coughs> they have meter, they have rhymes, they play with form, they're designed to be memorized. They're not a representation of how the ancient Greeks or the old English people actually talked back then. They're different from ordinary conversation in many of the same ways that internet writing is different from ordinary, from, from formal writing. Um, and this is one of the ways it is different, is that I can invoke some visuals. Um, so here's this plan that I sketched out on the floor for you, in case you weren't very close to see where I'm um, talking. There's plenty of space up in front, by the way, if anyone would like to uh, do that. <laughs> So here's this here's this set of quadrants that internet writing, which is the one I read that I'm really interested in, is often the latest instantiation of writing when it's informal. And thinking about it this way allows us to see that internet writing in internet language is the newest instantiation of something that's actually very old. Because writing has been informal longer than it's been formal. Because, you know, we have things like letters and postcards and notes that you leave on the kitchen table, which, or notes that you pass in class when you're not allowed to talk, but you can still kind of go back and forth. Um, and these have a lot of things in common with internet writing. You know, they're not in big paragraphs. They're often kind of in this weird space between the private and the the public and the semi-public. You know, if I take out, um, if, if you've got a folded letter, just imagine, imagine for everyone, uh, the strange and unfamiliar experience of receiving a folded letter in an envelope in the mail, um, which may not have happened to a lot of you recently, um, but you can still cast your mind back to this strange and unfamiliar world where you receive letters sometimes, um, and cast your mind back to what the etiquette feels like. When you get a letter, you read it, you put it back in its envelope, pull it up, you put it back in its envelope, you, you put it on the table. If someone comes in, picks up your letter, without a word to you, opens it, reads it, you're like, wow, I didn't know. <laughs> this is, there's some privacy you expect here when you have a, a letter folded in an envelope. And yet, if you receive a postcard from somebody, and hey, having a great time in Italy, you know, I'm eating a lot of gelato. 
Um, I don't know if people put in postcards. The only postcards I've actually written have been in foreign language classes as writing demonstrations. So I don't actually know how to write a natural sounding postcard. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the it, idea it's great for some things, it will destroy your ability to write postcards. Um, <laughs> write a foreign language, I said. Uh, so if you receive a postcard, uh, imagine that you've received a postcard, and you set it on the table, and someone comes in and picks up the postcard, and looks the message on the back. This somehow doesn't seem like as much of a privacy violation to you. Because when someone sent that postcard, they knew that whoever was carrying your mail, I assume all letter carriers everywhere have read every postcard <laughs> that comes their way. Ooh, somebody's having gelato. <laughs> How exciting. How intimate. Right? You don't put things on a postcard that You'd be shocked and appalled if someone read. You know, probably the government is reading our postcards. Ooh, gelato. <laughs> um, probably the government's reading our postcards. This is, you don't put a, and by the way, my bank account number is. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the check that I'm sending you in the mail. I thought I'd send it as a postcard. <laughs> um, you know, you don't have this kind of expectation of privacy. I receive, I receive checks in the mail sometimes. Um, because I'm that kind of person. Um, but they, they always arrive in envelopes, they don't arrive in postcards. And so, thinking about the kind of... But you also don't expect your postcard to be photographed and put on the national news. You know, it's in a space where anybody could read it in principle, but in practice, you don't expect everyone to have read it. Someone knew that I enjoyed gelato. You know, breaking news, the ABC reports. Someone went to Italy and ate some gelato. That also not very interesting. Uh, postcards, normally. Um, so, when you... And this reminds me a lot of Twitter. When I post a tweet, I don't expect it to be private. That would be kind of weird. Anybody in principle can see it. But I also don't expect it to go viral and expose me to millions of people who now hate on me like, I've just arrived in Italy, I'm enjoying some gelato. Like, oh my god, gelato, you couldn't possibly, terrible! You know, like, arrive in like an army of gelato trolls. Because <laughs> this is what happens on the internet, right? Um, to go after my gelato preferences, or even like, gelato inquisitors to be like, but which kind of gelato <laughs> did you get the raspberry? So, this kind of semi-public, I expect it to be somewhat obscure, and yet people can kind of read it. Even on a postcard, I'm, I'm confined by space. I can't, you know, like I am on Twitter, I can only put so many characters on a postcard. Um, there's, it's got this kind of weird, and, if I wanted to, I might ornament my postcard with a nice little smiley face. Um, I might draw a little sketch of the Eiffel Tower. I don't know how to draw a too easy fountain, but pretending I went to Italy, so we're going to switch to Paris for this metaphor. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna, I, might, I might draw a little sketch of the Eiffel Tower to be like, oh, yes, look, I'm in Paris now. Um, after I went to Italy, I just uh, popped over. Um, so these are the kinds of things that you might put on a postcard. You might ornament it. You might have it be semi-public, <coughs> you might talk about these kinds of things. And what I like about thinking of internet language in this space is that you can also think about it in terms of having historical precedent, rather than being this thing that emerged from nowhere. So with that in mind, let's think about a couple other questions we can ask about internet language and what thinking about their answers in terms of their historical precedent and their other types of styles might lead us. Here's a question. How does technology affect language? So, this has been a question for a while. Um, a lot of the people that, some of the people that wondered about this question were this kind of like early 1800s wave of dialectologists who were in one of the most memorable ones, this is the one I love. Uh, we're still in Europe for this metaphor. I wasn't planning on ending up there. Um, so there was a linguist called Jules Girera who sent a man named Edmond Edmond around France on a bicycle for four years to map out all of the dialects. 
and he'd go to all the little hamlets on his bike, and he'd find an old person to talk to because old people have like the best dialects. Um, and he'd interview them, he'd write them down, this is the 1800s, um, and then he'd, he'd fold this up and he would mail it back to Jules Genera in Paris, and then he would get back on his bicycle, and he'd go to the next village, and he'd record them, and he'd do that, and people were very interested in this because they were worried that technologies like the printing press and the newspaper and the mass media were going to be eradicating France's local dialects. Uh, and it turns out, so they produced these dialect maps, some of them are online, you can look them up, you can look them up, uh, and you can find where, so they think the French should be studied in school as one language. Turns out there are lots of lots of French and lots of dialects, um, and they've, they've drawn all these maps. And you can see where, for example, you know, mercredi, which you may know is the French word for Wednesday, in other areas people say dimer, like the, they put the D, which means day, on the opposite side of the word, um, like happens in dimanche. That one, that one clicked, and the other ones didn't. Um, and it turns out that, the, you know, the northern dialects did spread a bit more, because that's where Paris is. Um, but like, you know, here's some stuff that, that, he, that he noticed. Um, and, you know, another couple hundred, another hundred or so years go by, people looking at mapping out American dialects, um, they send a bunch of people around in word wagons, the Dictionary of American Regional English, um, send people out in word wagons, which are the, like, kind of station wagons with, like, or, I don't know if they're station wagons or, like, BW vans, outfitted with, like, a gas stove and an icebox and a little tiny bed. Um, and they'd go record people, and they'd wander around like the grocery store, like eavesdropping people, and they'd be like, ooh, yeah, that's cool about that. Um, and then they'd like go take them back officially and record them in their, I uh, give them the speech, you know, do them. And they produce this map of, uh, you know, all of the different places people talk. And I'm not aware, uh, and probably if, if someone has done this, maybe someone, maybe someone will tell you after the talk. Um, I did try to see if there were any maps of like people had doing this in Australian English, and I haven't found them, so maybe someone would like to do this. I know the linguistics roadshow was doing this like internet survey data where you could ask people like, where do you say, do you say potato cake, or do you say potato scallop? Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you say fritter, the other one? Um, so in the internet era, you can do these kinds of maps where you say like, do you say bathers, or do you say cozy, or do you say togs? Or the other one? Swimmers. Swimmers, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the Dictionary of American Regional English found out that television and the mass media and the radio had not been eradicating original dialects. Um, and then later generations of surveys, you can say, oh, what if we just made this survey in like a little web form and people just could click on a couple buttons and we didn't have to send out a guy on a bicycle <laughs> but like some people in vans. Uh, you could just have people, people click, on, click on the things, which makes it a lot faster. Um, so, and you can, you can notice these things and say, you know, does technology like, change how people, people do these types of things? Another thing you can do, um, and this is something that, that you can also, another thing you can do, especially in the internet, is try to mine Twitter for people who have made tweets with geolocation data turned on, so you can see exactly where this tweet was made from. And if you keep doing this, you can discover that like, people, in, um, people in some areas say, like people in, I think it's Southern California, say hella. People in Northern California do not say hella as much. Um, and you're like, ooh, this is, a, this is a regional divide that we're aware of, and we can map it onto Twitter uh, and see if people actually do this based on these particular areas, uh, which is pretty nifty. Um, so, to, but to back up for a second, we're thinking about what are the different contexts in which language is used, the fact that we, why do we have this perception that mass media creates a leveling of dialects and is this kind of standardizing, homogenizing force, and yet when we look at internet data, when we look at survey data, we find that people actually don't necessarily do that. And I think it's because formal language is often more restricted, more highly codified, more towards uh, you know, potentially a national norm or an international norm or a regional norm. And informal language, both the kind that we do in face-to-face -face communication and the kind that we write down, is often more informal. Um, and this, this kind of explains some of the worries that people have when it comes to technology, that, oh, people are writing in this sort of weird sort of way, are they going to be able to write essays anymore? 
you know, are the kids going to use emoji in their essays? <laughs> because this is a different, you know, text messages are a different genre. You don't, you don't write emoji in your essays any more than you give a class presentation, you know, with, you know, lots of conversation and in a, in a specific, in, in the style that you talk to your friends. Both of these are different types of genres. And this brings me to another question, which I think is particularly interesting in the internet era. And you'll notice that I have self-referentially uh, used lowercasing throughout this talk because I thought it seemed more internet. <laughs> <laughs> when you pop your keys, it makes things funnier when you sit on the microphone. Watch. <laughs> so, We've got this question of what is punctuation for? What's the purpose of having punctuation in stuff? Why, why put extra squiggles in with the letters? Um, and if you read this slide, uh, you might think, well, it indicates whether something's a question. That could be true. But if I deleted this punctuation, this, this question mark here, you would still know this was a question. Because it has the words in the order that we associate with questions. So this isn't quite doing it enough. Um, so let's back up a little bit to formal writing again. Um, if we go back to the, in, in, early in the history of English writing, English was not, English borrowed its alphabet from Latin, um, and medieval scribes had a, you know, wrote most of the things that they wrote in Latin. Uh, but the problem was, because this is left over from like, the legacy of the bureaucracy of the Roman Empire, the problem was is that People were getting worse and worse at Latin because no one was really actually speaking it anymore. Latin was getting harder um, because people had to learn how to learn Latin in order to learn how to read and write because not very many people were writing in the vernacular. And so when you've got a bunch of like second language Latin speakers being like, so this is really difficult. And another thing that's making this extra difficult for us is that Latin until this point is written without any spaces or punctuation. So you've been on a word search. <laughs> This is what Latin looks like. <laughs> just like, it's just a grid, basically. And you might like, even cut a word in half to make it go on to the next line. Uh, and so a lot of people read kind of out loud, just kind of mumbling under their breath to figure out where the beginnings and ends of the words stopped. And some people were like, do you know what if we put some spaces between the important parts? Because then you would know what the parts were. People were like, ah, yeah, that'd be interesting. We could do that. Um, <laughs> And there's this period where English punctuation is especially in flux, where you know you have like kind of you have a there's one period where you have dots at different heights of the line, so you have like a, a higher dot and a middle dot and a lower dot, and they represent like different amounts of pauses you can take in between things. So there's this period of flux in punctuation, and punctuation comes into its kind of standard solidified form that we now think of kind of classic punctuation in the era of the printing press, when you have fewer people controlling the means of production to get these things out. Um, but in the internet context, there's also something else you can do with punctuation. And that's convey a tone of voice. So rather than saying, you know, okay, we're going to say these ones are the sentences, these ones are the lists, these ones are the, the questions, these are the exclamations, you could also use it to say, well, when you ask a question, your voice often goes up at the end of the sentence. And so maybe if you want to indicate that your voice is going off the end of the sentence, we can put a question mark there, even if I'm not actually trying to indicate that my voice is going up. Or if you wanted to indicate um, that your voice is kind of going down, you could use a period. Because a period is conventionally associated with a kind of sentence where your voice goes down. And so if you want to indicate that something's extra serious, or potentially extra sarcastic, or potentially just extra there, or there's a pregnant pause, you might use a period or several periods. And the space in between, if you just kind of want to indicate an ordinary sentence that isn't really, ordinary phrase that isn't really ending in particular, you could just not use punctuation at all, because you have something else in the technological era, which is the line break, or the message break. And you could just hit send after each one, and you don't need the period to tell you the utterance is finished. 
there are some problems with this. And this is that there are some differences between how people interpret these. Um, so this is this is this is a way of doing things that's very internet first. You know, if you're going to send a message, you need to hit enter, you need to hit send in order for it to send. That is the minimum thing that is required in order for someone to receive your message. Um, the line break is important, uh, and it doesn't really matter if you're like wasting pixels. That's not really a thing. You can waste paper. But there's not really like a waste of pixels, like, oh, you're putting in so many line breaks, like, you're using up the pixels, like, extravagantly. <laughs> this isn't, that's not how, that's not how screens work. That's not how data works. Um, so, on the other hand, if you go back to postcards, you have, uh, you do have a waste of paper. If you want to convey a message on a particular size of postcard, you need to actually be able to fit it in that space. And so if you want to say, okay, this is somewhere kind of halfway between a you know, full ending sentence and just like a you know, small comma bit of a sentence, I don't really want to commit, this is pretty informal, I don't really want to commit to whether this is like a real sentence or this is only like a partial sentence, because at some point when I was learning how to do punctuation, someone told me about dependent and dependent clauses, and that wasn't really particularly fun for me, so I'm just going to not commit to whether this was actually a full clause, uh, because this is informal anyway, it's just a postcard. I'll just put dot, dot, dot uh, in between the, between the sentences. Uh, and so, and this is also something you see in, in early emails, you see in the punctuation text message practices of often older people who are kind of oriented towards offline norms where you can waste paper as the thing that you're trying to accomplish uh, when you're sending someone an informal message. The problem is when you have people on the other side, now my spaces, my places stand for something else, I'm sorry, I ruined my metaphor. Um, now you're, you have this thing where, okay, we know that you can send individual messages and that's what distinguishes your individual sections. And so dot, dot, dot can mean something else because it might as well mean something else because it's there. And so at that point, you have a dot, dot, dot that means sarcasm or it means a pregnant pause or something left unsaid or passive aggression or anger or all of these additional meanings. Both of these systems are totally fine. The problem is what happens when they collide. Because then you get something like, oh, great, I'll pick you up in, in five minutes. Okay, dot, 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 dot. And depending on which set of norms you're using, you can be like, right, that was just like an ordinary sentence that I didn't want to commit to whether it was a full clause or not. Or you can be like, oh no, something's gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this person is really mad at me. <laughs> um, or, like, here's this funny thing with the YouTube video. Ha 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 ha, dot 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 dot. <laughs> Again, the problem is not with either of these sets. The problem is what happens when they collide. Because you can get, oh, okay, you know, I'm just, I'm just not committing, I'm trailing off, here's, here's, here's where I'm going, this is, this is just like it's not, a formal, it's not a formal sentence, so I'll just use this dot to dot to indicate that I'm not being formal, and have this problem. I sometimes kind of notice like more gray hairs on the side of the audience, and like more younger people who are nodding at the younger people's statements on the side of the audience, which <laughs> you know why two sides. Um, so, they're dot dot dot. This is, this is fine. This is, this is indicating a formality. You're doing a great job here. Uh, you are as long as everyone else has your set of norms, which is the problem because if you don't have that set of norms, you're like, don't you like funny videos of puppies? <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> what happened? Why, why is this? What, what's, what's, wh where is this laughter coming from? Um, and I think this, again, oh, I didn't change slides. You've seen this diagram before. Uh, because I really like it. Um, depending on whether you're orienting your communicative norms towards an offline set where you can have a waste of paper, and when you're thinking about kind of that, the teacher's red pen of expectations, the kind of invisible reader that you have for your writing is the, you know, the high school English teacher that you had uh, that said, you know, this isn't, this isn't what you're supposed to do. I've got to worry about this. Or whether you're orienting your norms towards the internet, where you say, 
here's what I'm trying to accomplish, and my invisible reader is on the other end of the phone. My invisible reader isn't my former English teacher, my invisible reader's on the other end of the phone, and they're my friend, and we have this set of norms that we've developed, and we didn't, we didn't necessarily get them from somewhere, uh, from some authority. It's, this is the kind of tone voice that I'm trying to convey. And this is obviously the question we've all been waiting for. <laughs> um, this is the bit that, um, so, we talked about tone voice, but there's also something else that's missing in internet communication. And that thing is also the rest of the body, not just how I say the words that are coming out, but also what I'm doing with my face and my hands and my gaze when something's being said. And this can often change, change the interpretation of the words that I'm saying. So, for example, uh, if I say something like, good job, good, this is sincere, everybody's happy. If I say, how about can you see my eyes right now? If I say, good job, <laughs> with an eye roll, um, or if I say, good job, <laughs> uh, fuck that guy, uh, <laughs> Somehow, I think, just based on the response that I'm hearing, you made that a little bit of a different interpretation from the first one, and then from the second one, and from the third one. But like, no one laughed when I said, good job, because that one was sincere, or at least trying to be sincere, or perhaps like, too aspirationally sincere. <laughs> good job. Um, and this, or if I'm like, good job. You know, something else. You may recognize some of these as also occurring as cartoon characters on your phones. Um, and I don't think this is an accident that we can use them in a similar sort of way. So, sending someone good job with a thumbs up emoji versus sending someone good job with a rolling eyes emoji uh, or a middle finger emoji or a shrug emoji can alter the tone and the interpretation of the message of sending them in a very similar way as doing those same messages with these particular kinds of gestures. And more broadly speaking, I think that it's also not a coincidence that the most popular emoji are the face and the hand emoji, and sometimes also the heart, but like you can do your heart. Um, or like heart, I have a microphone there. Um, <laughs> you can do it. The, these are the these are the places where you have the most common emoji. You know, there's a turtle emoji. There's a uh, a kangaroo emoji now, which I was very excited to learn, uh, which I assume was created entirely for me in honor of my visit to Australia. <laughs> um, there. But they're generally not quite as popular. Um, you know, they're, they're the ones you kind of mine in the depths of the emoji set for when you're playing around, or when you're trying to illustrate something, when you're like, okay, I'm really bored. I'm on my phone anyway. I guess I might as well see what wacky new emoji they've added since the last time I checked. Uh, and maybe I can send them to someone. Because like we don't have anything else to talk about anymore, but we still want to be chatting. <laughs> Which I think is not an underrated thing for emoji, because in the face-to-face -face communication, we also have the ability to hang out with each other without actually saying anything. You know, like if we're just sitting around, watching the sunset or something that people do with their phones. People do when they don't have phones, watch the sunset, okay. Um, so if we're sitting around watching the sunset, you know, you and I can be sitting there watching the sunset. We don't have to say anything, we know that we're both there. But this runs into problems when we try to do something like that on an internet-enabled device. Uh, there's particular, you know, we can do this on Skype or something, like, we can both be there and be like, 
you know, just, just kind of poking around in the background, occasionally saying something, but not necessarily doing that. You can do that with video chat. Um, when it comes to text-based communication, which is often what we're doing, um, is especially the kind that I'm super interested in, it's often hard to indicate the meta message of we want to be talking to each other, we, don't have, we want to be spending time together, but we don't have a specific thing to say. And I think this explains a lot of the popularity of this kind of trolling through the emoji depths um, and looking at the, like, oh, hey, here's another gift. This dog is really cute, I promise. Um, we're like, here, if so it is, and here's a cat that's also cute. Um, like, this is very similar to, like, let's sit on the couch and watch the cat be silly, right? If you have a cat. Uh, I also don't have a cat. Um, so, this kind of, like, hanging out is something we can do with our bodies and with our gestures in physical space, and it's also something that emoji let us do in a virtual space. And it also kind of gets us to get us back here. How do you like this chart? I'm trying to do a lot. Um, it also kind of gets us back here because this is one of the questions um, that people pose to me when I say I'm interested in emoji, uh, especially you know people who are of a worrying bent. Uh, they'd say, but aren't you worried that like English is going to get replaced with emoji? <laughs> First of all, anybody who asks this question, I want you to ask it to me in emoji. <laughs> Otherwise, I won't accept the premise that you could possibly replace English with emoji unless you ask me this question in emoji. And I want like a full sentence. Like, no, like, cooler red. And also, okay, wait, just pointing this out here. You're not allowed to use the alphabet emoji. In, there's like the ABC or the ABCD emoji. I know these exist. I posed this challenge before. And it is cheating to use emoji that have letters in them to propose the demise of the letters. <laughs> um, so no one tweet that one at me. But if you have a better suggestion for, you know, will emoji replace English, um, please. Please submit that to me in emoji. I submit that if anyone does this, I'm going to get 20 different answers. And if I show them to the next audience, they're going to have no idea what they meant. I've also tried this one. <laughs> so, it, 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 something is different, right? They're not, they're not equivalent to the words. They, they, don't, they don't work like the words. I don't know what the emoji is for replace. I don't even know what the emoji is for emoji. And this is kind of a major disqualifying criteria because every language I've ever heard of has a name for itself. Um, and if not, you could easily make one. And yet, like what's the emoji? Is it, is it the smiley face? Because that also means smiley face. Um, one time when I uh, issued this challenge, someone sent me happy face, uh, speech bubble, or like the speech microphone bubble thing, and uh, the, oh, the, the one that, that one? Yeah, these, these ones up here. Uh, and then also like the ABC emoji, and leaving aside the disqualification of the ABC emoji, uh, because I had to add that caveat later, this is also very easily interpretable as I get happy when I sing the alphabet song. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is a problem. This is not how languages work. But the deeper question that people are asking when they say, are emoji a language, like, what are they doing, could they replace English, is, I think, still a really, really interesting question. And the question they're really asking is, what are emoji doing in communication? And is that a thing we should be worried about? Is that a thing that's ever going to show up in the, this quadrant with your books and newspapers? And there has been a book uh, published in emoji. Well, it's an emoji on one side and English on the other side of blogs. Um, and this is uh, Emoji Dick, which is a translation of Moby Dick into Emoji. <laughs> um, and the first sentence is, um, uh, let's see if I remember how it goes. So it's telephone emoji, um, man with the mustache emoji, whale emoji, sailboat emoji, and the okay hand. <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone here knows the opening line of Moby Dick, so if you do, 
you just just stay quiet for a sec? Um, does anyone know who hasn't read Moby Dick recently recall this famous opening line based on the sequence of emoji? You all are failing at the emoji language exam. <laughs> Why isn't this completely obvious? <laughs> so this is supposedly a translation of call the Ishmael, uh, which is the opening line. So you have like the telephone, which is like call, is very clever. Uh, and you have the, the man who's, who's Ishmael, which is, I guess, you know, probably it could be like literally any other man, but okay. Um, <laughs> and then you have the whale on the boat because that's within emoji dick, but that's within emoji dick, but that's actually not in the opening sentence, so I'm not quite sure why they made that decision. Okay. Um, and I think that you, you read through the rest of this book, which I have done, um, because I stop at nothing in the service of really good and hard hitting uh, internet linguistic research. Um, so you read through the rest of this book, um, and all of the sentences are kind of like this. You're like, I can kind of see where you were going there. I don't know why you made that decision. Maybe, okay. There isn't necessarily an obvious correlation. And so I think what this project is like, it's an interesting art project. I like art. I think this project is a lot more like trying to render Moby Dick in interpretive dance. <laughs> or maybe trying to render Moby Dick in charades. Where you're like, there's a whale? <laughs> there's a man with a mustache? Hi, call me Ishmael. Um, I, I, I haven't read Moby Dick in a while, I, and I will say that rereading Emoji Dick for this did not really enlighten me very much as to what actually happened in the plot. There's a whale. Um, <laughs> so, and this is a lot more like interpreting Moby Dick in something like pantomime or something like gesture, something like charades, where I'm going to say, okay, you know, there's a whale, here's some, here's some stuff that's going on. But it's really hard to render, say, the name Ishmael in pantomime. I'm really not quite sure how I would do that. I'm not sure how I would, how I would gesture uh, Ishmael. Obviously, I could do it if I spoke a sign language, but sign languages are languages, and we've already established that you don't kind of don't do that. Um, so I need it to be a full-fledged language if I wanted to render these kinds of things, and interpretive dance and charades and gesture are not quite up to that task, even when they can be really interesting art projects. So, you know, Emoji Dick came out a few years ago now. Um, I think we were going to see like a, a tremendous burst in emoji literature. The time is already plenty here. We haven't, so, you know, what else is going on? But I think there's a deeper question to, well, in that case, why haven't we seen newspapers and books and something and stuff publishing themselves entirely in emoji? And one of the answers here, I think, can come when we actually look at the emoji data for how people actually use emoji. So the most popular emoji um, is the face with tears of joy emoji, <laughs> um, which is sometimes glosses crying, laughing, or LOL. <laughs> And the, one of the most popular sequences of emoji are face with tears of joy, face with tears of joy. The next most popular sequence is face with tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy. <laughs> the next most popular sequence, wait for it, is tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy, tears of joy. And then you get down into the you know, incredibly more obscure and less popular sequ sequences like smiley face, smiley face, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Um, Kissy face, hard kissy face. Um, these are not, let me say, the stuff of which great literature is made. <laughs> this is not, these, you know, you could, you could try to write some sort of sentence in emoji. I could write, like, you know, the, the, the curly girl with curly hair emoji, which finally exists now. Um, and the hard emoji and, like, a dog emoji to be like, I love my dog. I don't have, still don't have a dog. Um, or I like dogs in general. You know, there's no real way of knowing. Um, I do like dogs. Um, I just don't have one. Um, so, you know, you, you could in principle write some sort of sentence type statement in emoji. And when we look at the data, people actually don't do that. People write a whole bunch of the same face or a whole bunch of the same hand. Um, and what this actually looks like is a lot more like what we do in our gestures, where we often do a whole bunch of the same gesture or like a whole bunch of the same gesture, or a whole bunch of the same gesture, just like several times in a row, and somehow doing a whole bunch of the same gesture is like fun in a way that saying a whole bunch of the same word is 
like, not, 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 really, 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 what people, 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 people say, say, say. So the place where we find all this repetition, you know, it was fine when I was doing this all the time. This is within the range of a normal set of communicative actions that people take. Yeah, this is great. You can be doing this. This is reasonable. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, somehow, 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 this is just not. Okay, I'll stop really this way. It's not quite the thing that people do when you do it in words. And so we want to say, okay, let's let's take a data-driven approach to this and see where do people actually make all this repetition. It shows up in our gestures. It's totally reasonable to do the thing in our gestures. Most of the time when I'm having a conversation, I don't also narrate my own conversation by acting out every single word that I'm saying in full. I kind of pick a, pick a more limited subset of gestures and do those. Um, and that works pretty fine. And the other thing that I really like about this is it kind of illuminates where emojis stand on the communicative spectrum. So what I have in an ordinary conversation, I'm going to do a lot of gestures, right? I'm going to be back and forth conversation. Next time you're in a restaurant, look over at the other tables, and you can tell who's talking in the conversation by who's gesturing, even if you can't tell what they're actually saying. You can, you can watch who's talking, who wants to talk. Maybe you might just put a word in, <laughs> edge wise. And you can tell who's, you know, who's listening, who's, who's talking based on their gestures. You can't tell he's exactly what they're saying. You know, sight, sight eavesdropping on people is still pretty anonymous. Whereas listening on people, you know, ear eavesdropping on people is like very much not anonymous. So the amount of information that's conveyed in sequences of like thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up emoji is not a whole lot of information. It's supplementary to the words that you're saying along with it. And most of the time we know that people do type words along with their emoji. Um, so you're adding all that information. In a similar way, when you look at those sequences of emoji by themselves, they look really kind of, okay, here's a bunch of things you could feel, here's a bunch of attitudes you could have um, that people add on top of what, they're, of what they're doing. Rather than, here's this additional whole extra sentence that I'm trying to add, even if I could write, you know, I heart dog. Um, you could do it, it's just not very common. So this helps illuminate some things about how emoji fit in to the communicative paradigm. When you're having an ordinary conversation, you, go, you, do, you do a lot of gestures back and forth. And yet, when you're public speaking, I'm very conscious of my gestures at the moment. I'm doing them in a very stylized sort of way. I'm deliberately not putting my hands in my pockets and jingling the coins that are sitting there. Because you know, this is some advice that you give novice public speakers. It's like, watch a video of yourself, and you'll see all these annoying little nervous things that you do that you didn't realize. This isn't an advice we give people for conversations. Like, watch a video of yourself and have a conversation, and you'll notice how to have a conversation better. We don't normally give this kind of advice. We have to listen to the other person and make sure that you're engaging and having, you know, having a back and forth. Um, we don't do so. We we do a lot more kind of stylized gestures. Uh, in public speaking. If you watch other types of formal speaking, so for example, I could have been delivering this talk from here, where you might have had some difficulty seeing my gestures at all. Maybe I could have just sat here this whole time. Um, if you watch uh, talking heads on the news, they, for very good reason, often stand behind a desk. They often don't really gesture. They got cut off kind of at their elbows. You can't really see them, even if they are gesturing. Or they have like, three pieces of blank paper to like carefully shuffle um, so they have something to do with their hands that's like, okay. Um, so these kinds of bits of gesture are very curated and very stylized. You know, listen to the radio, which is no gesture at all. Um, the actors, when an actor is delivering their line, when you're figuring out what an actor is going to do, um, you often have this kind of very stylized sort of 
set of gestures for that actor to accomplish. Um, and if the actor's gesture went wrong, if I'm a character in a play, and I'm like, good job, you really want me to be doing the right gesture along with this. Um, and so these are very stylized. And there's examples of stylization of gestures and prescription of gestures for formal speech all the way back to like Roman orators and other people who are like, you know, here's how a good speaker should gesture, um, which kind of goes back to that sort of prescriptive tradition that you end up with in formal varieties. Um, and it, so you, you have this distinction between how we gesture when we're doing a public speech versus how you gesture when you're doing a conversation. It's a lot less stylized, it's a lot less, less excited. And it's a lot less kind of emotional. It's going to emphasize the point, be kind of a punctuation, but it's not going to be, it, it's going to have a very narrow emotional range between the like kind of serious and the kind of excited. And it's not going to, like, I'm not going to come in here and be really, really angry at you all the time. Um, or be kind of passive aggressive, like, I hope you like this talk. <laughs> <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't part of the emotional range that we normally associate with like, stylized public speaking. Um, at the same time, so when we think about this in terms of writing, formal writing has a narrow emotional range. It's, you know, here's a report, here's what happened, here's a book, here's a narration of things that are happening in a particular context, here's a you know, news report, here's this, here's an academic article that's like we did this study and this thing happened, the p-value is this. Um, and that's kind of, it has that narrow emotional range because that's kind of what we mean when we say formality. That's kind of what we mean when we say, okay, here's, here's what's going on here. And we have lots of tools at our disposal to expand our emotional range and not all of them are emoji. You know, sometimes we can use multiple punctuation marks Exclamation marks, like exclamation marks, still hundreds of years in, only marginally acceptable in really formal writing. <laughs> like even if you find a really exciting scientific result, <laughs> you're like, yeah, we cured cancer. <laughs> you can't title your scientific article, we cured cancer exclamation mark. <laughs> That's really exciting. You don't get to title your scientific article, you have to be like, you know, uh you're like, responses to treatment for blah, 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 which successfully output blah, blah, blah in patients. Um, <laughs> oh, cancer. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is probably how you're going to title that. For me, you're going to say, like, successful cure for cancer discovered. Like, this is like, that's, that's pretty good, right? That's like already very exciting. Um, you don't get to put an exclamation mark in there. You'd be like, and the p value was significant, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> Results, we prove that other guy's theory wrong! Exclamation point! <laughs> we can't even get exclamation points into scientific papers. What makes us think we can get emoji into them? <laughs> like, lol, that guy's theory was wrong. <laughs> 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 like, I can't do this like a scientific talk, but I'm getting a talk about my results. I'm like, and then, um, we found this, and as you can see in the chart, you know, here are some things. This were, these were the inputs, these were three weeks, these were the controls. Um, and as you can see, this results were successful, and the hypothesis was disproved. Great, this is the kind of thing you say in an academic talk, you know, you're like, whoa. <laughs> Our chart's really great, guys. Um, and we found some really good results, and those idiots don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, you know, smiley face. <laughs> narrow emotional range in formal talks, even if you're thinking, yeah, we finally fixed it, we finally solved it, we finally figured out what was going on here, you still have a narrow emotional range in the technical papers or the technical presentations that you're using to convey those results. It's not a question of like, can we put the emoji in? I mean, you sure you could put an emoji in a scientific paper if you are writing, as I have done, a scientific paper is about emoji. <laughs> Um, it's really hard to implement technically. Like trying to get emoji in LaTeX is like very difficult. <laughs> it's a great crowd. I made a LaTeX joke and they laughed. Um, <laughs> you have to you have to save them as a PDF and then embed the PDF. <laughs> Each of them separately. Like one emoji is a heart is a PDF and then you have to embed that whole thing. It's terrible. Uh, don't write emoji papers in LaTeX. But even though we were writing a paper about emoji, where we put emoji in, we put them in as a mention, as in, people use this, this, this heart emoji a lot. We didn't put them in as a use. We're like, we heart the people who use the heart emoji. Because <laughs> you don't 
wanted to do that in a scientific paper, you're not supposed to love your subjects, <laughs> even when you're like many linguists and experimenting on your own children. <laughs> You don't get to say, and my kid was so cute when they said this, like, interesting linguistic thing. You still have to be like, and the subject, who was two years of age, lived with the researcher. <laughs> and made the following interesting speech errors. Um, there's, there's a different sort of tone that you take, and it's not about the specific emoji. Like, you know, you can use an emoji as a graphic design element. You know, you can use, like, a pointing hand emoji to point out, like, here's a thing. Um, or here's an OT tableau. Um, <laughs> you can use them for, for graphics reasons, but you don't get to use them to expand your emotional expressive range for the same reason you're not supposed to be passive aggressive or too excited in a scientific talk, which is like, this is just a genre convention, and that's kind of how the genre convention works. And I think this is very reassuring when it comes to, okay, but like, are we going to publish all the books in emoji? Because if what emoji are really doing is expanding our expressive range, and you know, even back, you know, even back when we had other expressions, you can't be like, isn't this just the these knees? Like other types of slang don't tend to make their way into scientific papers either. Um, and it's a feature of formal language, whether it's written or spoken, not so much a feature of these particular graphic graphics. I keep abandoning my water because I want to be not behind the podium. So, this is the thing that I think writing plus informality is the particular area where we can use the internet as an entry point to it, but what ends up happening is that the entry point of writing and informality ends up showing us things about how non writing and non-informality <laughs> actually <laughs> work. Formality, that's, that's what you say. <laughs> uh, but I, I want to have an allegation there. Um, so looking at internet language, looking at the types of context that people choose to do when we're suddenly writing all the time, and that's really nifty, um, we're, we're writing a lot more than people used to do 50 years ago, and we're figuring out ways to express ourselves more clearly and communicate more strongly to the person on the other end of the phone. By phone, I mean the thing that you text on, not the thing you call on. <laughs> <laughs> than we were a generation or two ago. Than we were before we were practicing doing this all the time. And that's really exciting for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gretchen. That was lovely. Oh, yes, you have microphones. Um, that, that was a great talk. I just wanted to share something that I learned when I visited um, Carnegie Mellon University. They claim to be the first inventors of an emoticon ever. So they claim that on their department and the chat room board, they were the first ones to use an emoticon. I don't know. A lot of places claim this. It, that, I think, is the best attested one. It's, there's a thread by Scott Salmon that yeah. has, this, has this thing. I don't think there's been a, a more convincing end date of it. So. OK, cool. Yeah. Well, if you say it, then, then that means a lot to them, I'm sure. Um, and they say that they first invented the colon dash parentheses to sort of denote that they were not being serious, they were not saying something seriously, but that it was more to be meant as a light-hearted thing, because otherwise, in these chat rooms, they would think that they were being passive, aggressive, and serious, and they would get into arguments. So it's just a functional need, like we need to be able to put a tone into this, otherwise we get into arguments. I thought that was very interesting. Um, but let's give the floor to the audience. Does anyone have any questions? They're traveling microphones. They're, yeah, they're currently there. Microphone. And there. Um, we have one microphone right there. You first. In the middle. <laughs> and uh, it's right in the middle of everything. Um, I'm going to pretend. Uh, please name an affiliation for everyone. Yeah, thanks, um, yeah, thanks Gretchen. Uh, Dan, I guess University of Queensland. Um, so, do you think the. And 
I know this is how you titled your talk, is this internet language. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is a problematic title because actually what we are seeing are languages that in the same way when people talk about particular platforms, there's often a problematic way in which we talk about a platform as being almost like one thing. Or say, say take Reddit for example. There's not one Reddit, there are several mm -hmm. subreddits and there are behaviours and cultures that are very specific to certain kind of corners of these, these platforms. Do you think that we should talk about it as internet languages, right, in the plural form? Because there are a series of practices and such that we will perhaps observe across the breadth of internet. Um, there might be perhaps generalized forms and things that generalize out more than others in terms of standard communicative practices. But actually, it's at the edges where the really interesting stuff is, where we get very niche behaviors. So I think. I think you could definitely, I think it depends on which context of internet types of communication you're talking about. Um, I think there's a case to be made for talking about the internet as a, as a communicative context as a whole, because it's a kind of platform that any internet-enabled communication has certain things in common, you know, the ability to type emoji, or like, and I'm saying internet writing here, so I'm already limiting that because of course video chat is going to be something different. But, Internet, internet language in the sense of like the things that people text to each other, you know, there are differences in particular platforms, you know, how you type in WhatsApp versus how you type in, you know, Facebook Messenger or other types of, you know, like vanilla text on your phone, these kinds of things. Like there are various kinds of, you know, there are various kinds of individual co communities, there are various, you could, you could, you know, splinter this down all the way to the level of the individual conversation, you know, how I talk with my, how I text with my mom is different from how I text with my brother, or these kinds of things. Like, you could, you could splinter this all the way down. Um, I think this is kind of a problem that you run into when you talk about any sort of generalization. So, you know, does it make sense to ever talk about English when there are truly many Englishes? Does it make sense to ever talk about, you know, like, the speech of, of a particular age group, when of course everyone in that age group is also going to have individual differences. Does it make sense to ever talk about uh, you know, the speech of a particular area, when even within that area there's variation? So of course variation is fractal and goes all the way down, and I think the internet is no different for that. But there's also a, a commonality to a base set of expectations, like, you know, you don't like you can communicate in text with someone who isn't physically present uh, at real time speeds, which is common to this and relies on certain kinds of shared indications. So you know you have an is typing indicator on a whole variety of chat platforms, and this causes a certain type of stress when you see someone is typing, <laughs> and a certain kind of pressure to apply at a certain rate. Um, and you know in, even individual people respond to that stress differently. Some people are really you know. Uh, are really nervous about it, some people are really are, are pretty chill, you know, different people have different types of responses in this particular cases, but, you know, these are, these are features of internet communication broadly, or of, of the chat platform as a thing, that aren't, you know, a WhatsApp specific feature, or an iMessage specific feature that, that do those things, so I think it makes sense to say, okay, we can take this, this broad, this broad umbrella of these are the types of decisions that we make in, in, a, in a broader internet context, and then you can, we can drill down into individual platforms, individual subreddits, individual you know, chat groups, individual you know, Facebook groups, or these types of things. Like you, can, you, can drill down, you can always drill down to the level of the individual community, uh, or to the level of the individual person. I think one area of internet variation that's grossly under-researched at this point is change in time. Mm -hmm. So the internet speak of the 2010s is not the internet speak of the 1990s. And I think it's very easy to conflate internet speak across time and be like, you know, the, like, for example, in February 2015, we saw the use of the tears of joy emoji finally outstripped the use of the basic colon hyphen, er, colon parenthesis emoticon. Um, so there, that's a simple change over time. Uh, another change has been kind of the loss of the nose in the text-based emoticon. So do you write colon hyphen parenthesis, or do you write colon parenthesis? Um, Still in your son, the old generation. <laughs> well, and so this is the thing, is like older people, in, on average, write colon hyphen parenthesis, uh, and younger people tend to write colon parenthesis, but that data is from 2011, 
Um, and so now that we have emoji, there's also people have also been telling me kind of anecdotally, and I don't know how to study this formally, but if anyone has any ideas, please uh, please get in touch, or please please just do it and tell me the results. That people are interpreting the plain text-based emoticons as more formal than the colorful emoji. Um, and so a lot of people have said to me, when I send someone an email, especially if it's in like a business context. I might put a plain text emoticon, like, looking forward to our meeting, smiley face, text-based, but I'm never going to put the yellow smiley face, because that's too informal. <laughs> well, thanks, yeah, they're there. Um, so, you know, that's, that's real, and so, you know, maybe this means we all go all the way up the formality la ladder, and the, you know, colon hyphen parenthesis takes on this, like, really formal tone. Um, what you get is, you know, an email is kind of one of those kind of bridge forms of communication that's not quite as formal as, like, writing. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. Um, I think it's my down of white here. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, so, like, which, which bits are more formal, which bits are, but this has definitely changed over time, so this is the one that was, you know, created in the 80s on this CMU thread, um, and then this one arrived a bit later, these obviously arrived even later, and so, which ones, yeah, Yeah, there we go. And also they like from there. You know. So yes, you get these kinds of changes over time. You also get changes over time with um, older forms of internet slang being reinterpreted as sarcastic. Um, <laughs> So, you know, things like lol and grh and stuff like that being only interpreted as sarcastic, whereas these were kind of mainstream internet slang of the 1990s. So, you know, the way that you readopt another generation's like jeans styles. Oh, we're awful. Do people still say that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I can think of. <laughs> um, there's uh, one of the ones that I encountered when I'm looking through like lists of old uh, internet slang. <laughs> Styles because like there are these lists they're great. Um, is B C N U? B C N U. B C. Yeah, that's B C N U. No one uses this one anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, like I, I remember we used to use like C U. Oh yeah, just like. Yeah, yeah, like we used to use that one. Uh, I never used B C N U. Uh, it's like really clever. Maybe it's going to come back ironically, but like. Uh, so I think that it's, it's often underreported that there are generational changes and there are usage-based changes and like platform sometimes based changes in terms of which things people associate with internet slang. And you know, some people have also told me like I can't drop the nose and the smiley face because like I'm just not that young and like I, I need to acknowledge this. Like I don't want to try to seem cooler than I am. Um, like it's like how I can't say lit without looking like a fool. <laughs> no, I've tried. My sister laughs at me. Um, so uh, you know, like there's a there's a sense in which like you can't play slang that you're like too old for because you just sound like someone who's trying a little bit too hard. Um, so there's I think there's a lot of of individuals is making that goes into these particular types of things, which, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of variation into how people use it. I think we could do a lot more to drill down into like which different particular dialects, if you will, of internet language someone is speaking. Um, but I think it makes sense to talk about it as a whole as well because a lot of these things are kind of common features that you could find to internet media communication, uh, even though things change. Oh, well, so how much you are like, I'm not going to say. <laughs> so different. Well, I'm like, I mean, I can, I can, I can do a 10-minute feel like analogy, but like, we need to have dinner at some point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think we shouldn't get too overexcited. We should uh, leave some room for some more questions, maybe. Yeah. So, um, were there other people wanted to ask a question? Carmel, I see. Greg, I see. I don't know which one was first. I saw Carmel first, so she's first. Can I take some now? Greg Talk, Gretchen. Thank you. I was just wondering, nowadays there's autocomplete on your phone, right? And there wasn't, you know, back in the 90s. So, yeah. has that, I mean, there's no need to abbreviate in a sense. Yeah. Does that have an effect or is abbreviation just so much the thing? So, one of the things that I think it really highlights is how abbreviation is often used for stylistic purposes rather than for efficiency purposes. And we see, I think this is a very similar thing that we see with the, uh, this is great, uh, just keep writing them all in alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
so one of the things I think is really interesting about DNC is so we see people using um, text-based emoji uh, like um, like old-fashioned uh, like older acronyms or something for ironic purposes, or you know, deliberately using older emoticon styles because you want to kind of index something that's a little bit more conservative. Um, okay, you stop writing this. It's really distracting. Like you're reading them. <laughs> <laughs> words. It's like ooh, words. I need to read them. So uh, yeah, one of the things I think is really interesting is when you look at how people talk about using internet slang. This changes from uh, you know, the 90s to the, the current day, and in a lot of cases, in the acronyms are explained in this 90s context, of, like, it's faster, people aren't very good at typing, you know, like, you have ones people are doing, like, punch and pack style typing, and you're trying to be really fast, um, and, or if you're not a fan, they're like, people are just lazy, they can't be bothered to type on those whole words. So, what's interesting that happens is once you have an autocomplete as an option, well, you can't be using an acronym that's not in the autocompletes dictionary as a shortcut, because it actually takes you longer to enter it the proper way, especially if you insist on typing it in lower keys, which a lot of people do with acronyms, even though the uppercase versions are what you find in like lists of stuff. Uh, so you have to add in like the lowercase one, which means that when people are choosing these, it can't be because it's more efficient, or it can't be because they're just lazy, it has to be because they actually mean something socially. And that thing is, you know, I'm a person who's familiar with internet slang, or I know how to use this ironically, or I have a particular thing to try to communicate. So I think this is another interesting kind of bit of evolution that we see in that, uh, you know, deliberately typing something that's not in the autocomplete dictionary can showcase your linguistic creativity or can be a deliberate stylistic decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. I put some other, I mean, abbreviations people use, like EG and ASAP, people use even though they have autocomplete for a long time, yeah. and they do mean something a little bit differently, I think, than as soon as possible. Yeah, we're saying like, you know, EG, in fact, saying, for example, like that yes. has a slightly different connotation, or, um, you know, TJAF taps into something that, thank God it's Friday, doesn't tap into quite mm -hmm. the same thing as TGIF. You know, so they have, they have social media, and people say, well, what wow, people say, um, OMG out loud. Um, I know uh, children who say OMG and think it's answer, oh my gosh. It's really cute. <laughs> so these kinds of things are in the mouths of even kind of pre literate and pre internet kids uh, as, you know, here's another acronym. You know, OK started as an acronym from this language game popular like over 100 years ago. Um, it was an abbreviation of all correct. And there was this language game where you would deliberately misspell words, because obviously all correct does not begin with O and K, but O L L K O R E C T, um, and then you abbreviate that as OK, and it's this like in interesting meta joke. Um, and you can find the list. There's like there were like 20 of these, and OK is the only one that stuck around. So, which I think is going to be kind of like people in another hundred years looking back at our list and being like, B C and you, and like what the lol, what's, what's that? But they're still using lol. Um, they're just using it for something that's slightly different than all correct and okay. Yeah. Um, Greg? Can we get a mic or talk very loudly? No, get a mic. Yeah, I think a mic's better. Whoever's closer. Get your mics. Thank you. You sort of already touched on this a bit with sort of looking at change over time. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if you look closely at say the early 90s research that was being done on internet language. And I'm just curious if there was any like hypotheses or findings that were coming up with that in retrospect were kind of weird now. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, there are so many. <laughs> uh, I, I really like this paper that called um, the internet, uh, I want to say it was ill-suited for such social uses of language in a place of pretense and alienation with, you know, no room for, you know, genuine communication or something along those lines. Uh, so there were definitely some internet skeptics. <laughs> um, but there was also a really interesting paper about, I think it was a German chat group in the 1990s, and they found that people's use of internet slang and their attitude towards the internet as a place that could potentially be suitable for making friends were both positively correlated with the likelihood that they'd actually made friends on this like ancient chat room. Mm -hmm. um, and people who thought, who didn't use internet slang and who didn't think the internet was appropriate for using friends, and I don't know how, remember exactly how they disentangled these two variables, but I think 
I think the use of internet slang was also correlated with their belief that the internet was suitable to do social things on. Um, and this actually led to them making or not making friends, depending on whether they believed it was possible and they were using social things to do that, uh, to make that possible. So I look at that and I'm like, oh look, you, you figured it out. We just, the rest of us had to catch up with you uh, and figure out that you could actually make friends with the internet and, and have these kinds of social things. Um, so that one was, was very heartening. Roughly when was that? I, I think it was like the mid-90s, it was like still fairly, I don't remember when the, because there's always the, the, this is probably back in the papers, uh, which is that they always have this lag between like data collection, and I think this was definitely sometime in the 90s, I don't remember which, when the data collection happened compared to when the thing, but the citation is definitely in the book. <laughs> oh. So. Um, all right, next question. Yeah? Uh, Oh, or there, yeah. She's uh, 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 first, but oh, okay. let let her drop please. Thanks, Gretchen. You asked earlier if there was a word map in Australia. The oh. Australian Broadcasting Commission did a book called Word Map of Australia. Oh, fantastic! In the early two thousands, and then combined with the Borough Dictionary to do an online one. Oh, nice. So, okay. But what I wanted to ask is, are you seeing a more kind of consistent language? Regardless of like the regionalism, so for example, are you seeing more use in Australia of American terms like cookie and that kind of thing? And is that also going across into pronunciation? So for example, Americans say pecan or Nissan, Nissan um, which is different to how we say. Is it, is it playing out in those kind of areas as well? Um, so what I've seen in, in people's kind of Twitter Twitter map study is it all kind of the inverse and you could find a lot of these regional differences even the ones that are kind of poorly documented like looking at geotagged tweets and so I don't know if there are specifically geotagged tweet studies in Australia because they're definitely aren't in Canada and I'm kind of annoyed about that um, so people should do them more than just the US uh, is something that I would like to have happen um, the but what the American findings show at least is there's a very interesting one that uh, paper by Jacob Eisenstein and Umashani Kamalanathan, which finds that um, in tweets where people have hashtags, which you're using to try to attract a broader audience, like you put hashtag Oscars or hashtag, you know, whatever, politics or something like this, um, those tweets tend to contain less of a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and that's fewer emoticons, fewer emoji, fewer creative, fewer like phonetic respellings like gonna or dunno, uh, fewer regionalisms, fewer uh, like all of these kind of informal language features or potentially like as a, as a constellation, these tweets will be oriented towards a broad audience people kind of take that in a broad audience sense for, compared to tweets with at mentions where you're specifically calling attention to a particular user and those tweets contain higher levels of emoticons, emoji, abbreviation, like acronyms, phonetic respellings, uh, regionalisms, and all those constellation features. So people seem to be kind of aware of their audience, even at a micro tweet level uh, for where they're directing that. There's also been studies of minority languages on Twitter, and they also find that uh, it's more likely to put, so this, I think the study was on Frisian, um, uh, Frisian and whatever my majority language people speak who also speak Frisian, Dutch? Okay. Um, the, uh, so it's on the like, Frisian and a couple other like the minority European languages and the majority versions. Um, and they found that people were more likely to have kind of a tweet sent out, to broadcast tweets sent out in the world in Dutch, and then the replies would switch to Frisian when people knew that the other person was a speaker of it. In comparison to the inverse where you have your initial broadcast tweet in Frisian and people are replying in Dutch. So it seems like people are going to try to code switch into uh, a smaller language, which I and or into things associated with regional dialects, when you have kind of a more targeted audience and you know that that person is going to understand you in the spirit in which it's intended. Um, so that's something that, and I think when you when you scrape Twitter data as a whole, you end up finding okay, people still do use regional terms, people still do use other types of stuff. There have been a whole bunch of words that I didn't even know, you know, Australians were saying differently until I got here. <laughs> so people haven't stopped saying that, um, and I think. You know, there are, there are always a variety of forces at play. People do seem to use minority languages and minority dialects on social media. To follow up that last question, Pauline Bryant from ANU, the Macquarie Word Map that you mentioned was based on the pioneering work that I did in the late 80s on regionalisms. 
Gretchen, I'll send you some references to publications on that. One slight word of warning, the Macquarie um, people forgot to ask where the words were actually used. They asked where the informants were from, but not where the words were used. Gretchen, I'll see you afterwards. Yes, yes. please send it to me, this is great. Just do another review for me. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think uh, question and then I think we were out of questions or am I missing Okay, uh, maybe that's the last one then. Is that okay? okay. Um, go back to sort of the start of your talk that yeah. keeps these days kind of view of the internet language. Yeah. I'm curious whether there's research on uh, language acquisition and development in children mm -hmm. and particularly teens probably who have more technology use. Uh, because I get the sense from being a teacher that um, the amount of time spent in informal language in written form is very, very high. Mm -hmm. And although it doesn't mean that they necessarily can't distinguish between written forms, the actual fluency in some more formal written forms is, can be limited at times. And it's almost like a sort of statistical weight towards informal um, written language. And I wanted to ask that too in terms of communities where um, maybe literacy has been relatively low until, you know, maybe even the last few decades, mm -hmm. and whether that potentially has an impact on the way literacy <coughs> develops in languages that are just starting to get um, written systems and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, okay, so I think there's a couple questions going on here. <laughs> I mean, I think in terms of, like, kids being more used to writing informally than formally, I think that's, that's absolutely true, but it in a you know historical context before people you know before we all carried phones around in our pockets, we were also more used to talking informally than to writing formally as well, right? So there wasn't there was never a period where people were born knowing how to use the formal variety of a language or even had acquired the formal variety of a language by age two because we start off by acquiring the vernacular and the informal and we eventually get taught the formal which is formal because it requires explicit instruction and a set, different set of norms that aren't implicitly taught for a speech community. So I think that that's, you know, that, that's part of kind of the difference and seeing it as a, as a thing of, of informal writing is like, there's a really great uh, complaints about student papers from the early 1900s <laughs> about like these dang kids and they don't know how to write essays properly. <laughs> Uh, and you read people from like the early 1900s and like, you know, grading like intro, like first year university student essays and being like, you know, they don't know how to do all, any of these things that we expect them to be able to do. Uh, and say, well, yeah, you know, maybe this is just a thing of like, intro uni students don't know how to write essays yet. <laughs> uh, and less a thing of any particular kind of technological or social change being responsible for people who haven't been taught how to do something, not knowing how to do it. Um, so. I think there's, there's that. I think with respect to languages that have historically not been written down as much, I think it's absolutely really interesting to be looking at speech communities that are you know, figuring out ways to write their language on Facebook or Twitter or blogs or various places, even if it hasn't necessarily had a codified, formalized writing system developed. And they're saying, like, well, we're going to just figure out how to do this because I want to communicate my language and I want to do that. And there's some angst about that, I think, because often people do that in a non-standardized sort of way. So, you know, some people are using one version of the spelling, some people are using another version of the spelling, some people are using a third version, people are sometimes inconsistent, but they're doing this type of stuff all the time. And I think it's useful to recognize, again, looking at this kind of difference between formal and informal language, that regularized spelling in languages is also a relatively recent historical invention, and one that dates from kind of the post-printing press era. And so in an age where production and distribution and like reading and writing were equally easy, um, which is, or approximately equally easy for everybody, which is the case when everything is handwritten and there's no printing press, and it's also the case when everything is, is typewritten on, on digital devices, and it's not the case in this middle period of a printing press where something passes through the hands of an external body in order to make its way into the world. In both of these, uh, you know, more egalitarian distributions, varieties of writing for